Welcome to part two of this deep dive into explaining the mythology of Lost. If you haven't seen part one, which establishes the origins of the island, then be sure to check that one out. In this part, we are going to delve into the ancient past of the island, and explore how everything we saw take place in the series came to be, and more importantly, why it came to be. The island history is dense, complex, and mostly presented in glimpses. The writers gave us just enough breadcrumbs of information along the way so that we could connect the dots and see the bigger picture. Casual viewers of the series might not even scratch the surface of these details, but for the hardcore fans who paid attention and actively participated in trying to piece together the mythology of the show, there is an absolute wealth of story here, which we are going to unpack in all of its detail right now. In Season 6 episode, Across the Sea, we are shown how the mythology as we know it began, and the origins of the conflicts that lie at the heart of the series. And this origin and lineage begins with just one single character. Mother. So, who was Mother? Well, based on clues from the only episode that she appears in, it seems that Mother had been around for a very long time, and she had been protecting the light for centuries, possibly even millennia. We can see that she is already tired of her role when we meet her, and is looking for a replacement so she can be free from her responsibilities. We can also assume that Mother hails from an early civilization on the island, one that we never get to see. Her people found the island long ago by accident, and settled on its shores, or so Mother claims. How did you get here? The same way you got here. By accident. But there are no accidents on Lost. Everything happens for a reason. And the island has been bringing people to its shores for a very long time, independent of a protector's will. We don't really have any context for what Mother's life was like on the island before she became a protector. All we can assume is that the island allowed her to find its heart, as it needed a catalyst to begin a very long and involved series of events that would sustain its own existence, and the existence of all things. Perhaps Mother was drawn to the cave out of curiosity, and drawn towards the warmest, brightest light that she had ever seen or felt. And without anyone to warn her about the dangers of getting too close to the light, she went down into that cave much like a moth to a flame. In Mother's time, the source was pre-cork. Now before you jump to the comments to contest that claim, I will demonstrate the evidence that supports this reading as we move through this timeline. We'll get there, don't worry. But back in this ancient era, that waterfall that we see running down the mouth of the cave would have fed into a natural stream of water that flowed directly into, presumably, a crack in the earth, where the light was most concentrated. The heart of the island is volcanic in origin, as previously discussed, which means that this cave was, at some point during the formation of the earth, the mouth of an actual volcano, and the light would have flowed out from within it. Just imagine Mother wading her way through this shallow stream of water in the cave, directly to the edge of this hole in the world. And as she entered the open aperture of this source, she was instantly consumed by the light. This channel posits the idea that this moment could well have been the creation of the very first protector of the light, the start of the chain. We'll explore this idea in more depth a little later on in the video. What I'd like to explore now is how this event, a person entering the light for the first time, was almost certainly the creation of something else. The very first smoke monster. Yes, Mother was a smoke monster too, long before the Man in Black, and there is much supporting evidence that we shall examine to prove it. This dark cloud of energy can be interpreted in two different ways. A man of faith would see this as a person's soul ripped from their body, whereas a man of science would see this as a person's disembodied consciousness. Regardless of how you view it, these are both one and the same thing. The show establishes that you can only return to the source in death. Your inner light rejoins with the collective light of humanity to deal with your lingering issues before moving on for rebirth. And you were reborn, for lack of a better phrase, as a clean soul, without corruptions or darkness. 
but we also know your inner light can be corrupted whilst in the living realm, depending on the choices you make. The more bad that you do in your life, the dimmer that your inner light becomes. Those that are still dealing with their inner darkness in death must try to come to terms with it, or risk being trapped in purgatory forever, never being able to move on. This is what we see Ben wrestling with on the bench outside the church. Will he be like Sawyer, and find the love and the forgiveness in order to move on, or will he be like Anthony Cooper, forever trapped in a hell of his own making? It appears that you can only move into this fourth dimensional space that we know as the Flash Sideways through the liberation of your consciousness from your physical body. So if a person tries to enter the source on the mortal plane of existence, that physical body of theirs will die instantly, because the electromagnetic force is so powerful that there is no way to survive. Unless you're Desmond Hume, of course. So what gets spat out of that cave in Across the Sea is the darkness of a person's soul, all of their worst memories and thoughts and fears and feelings. Only the negative parts of that person survives. But this darkness becomes tethered to the energy at the heart of the island. And this is what happens to both Mother and later the Man in Black. Her body was now an empty vessel, and her consciousness, aka her soul, was now roaming the island without being anchored to a physical body. This smoke monster question is one of the key debates at the core of Across the Sea. We know Mother was a protector, but still many people challenge if she was also a smoke monster, so let's look at the evidence. In the audio commentary for the episode, showrunners Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse discuss the following. It is worth mentioning the idea that Mother is the smoke monster at this point in the game. That is interesting. She has laid waste to the entire village, and what an interesting theory that is, because one of the questions that keeps arising is, if Jacob's smoke monster was his brother, then who was the smoke monster before him? Or was the smoke monster actually created in this episode? Does good always need evil? And that is an excellent question to be asking. Now, it's clear to me that the showrunners are heavily implying that Mother is a smoke monster, but let's look to the actual episode itself. The first indication that something is different about Mother comes in the form of her sudden appearances. The first one is to Claudia by the stream. But then we see her appear again to the man in black, this time in the wheel chamber. Now notice how she managed to come down that ladder without making a single sound or being seen, and all in the short space of time that it takes to do this one single shot. If you look closely, Mother has appeared several feet behind the ladder, almost as if she teleported there. This is incredibly subtle detail, intended to leave room for ambiguity, in order to ignite debate. But really look closely at Mother's positioning in this scene, and consider the physics of where she has stood from the ladder, and zero indication of her having used it. Could it simply be a mistake in the geography of how this scene was blocked? Or is it intentional? We know that the writers communicated certain things to the directors of certain episodes, so this could very well be by design. Either way, this is only the beginning of these clues to Mother's true identity. We see that she knocks out a much younger and much stronger man with her bare hands by sheer force. Of course, this is plausible for a human woman to do to a human man, and not necessarily proof of any smoke detection, but what comes next is more definitive. Mother somehow manages to single-handedly destroy the wheel chamber and bury it under the earth, and she appears to have done this within the space of the man in black being knocked out. Now could a middle-aged woman really do this on her own? I suppose it's possible, but it's not very plausible. The man in black then discovers that she has also decimated his entire village, and not only has she burned the whole place to the ground, but she has slaughtered every living person in it men, women, and presumably children. We see that these villagers were armed with weapons, and would have fiercely defended themselves against any attack. So this is surely not the work of a single human being. This whole scene is actually very reminiscent of the aftermath following the smoke monster's attack on the others at the temple, in an earlier episode called Sundown. Look at the man in black wandering through the burning embers of his former home, and now look as we survey the carnage at the temple. These scenes are mirrors of one another, 
and another clue as to what was responsible for the village destruction in Across the Sea. The next piece of evidence comes in the form of Mother's warning to Jacob. She tells him that going down into the Cave of Light would be a fate worse than death. The conversation goes like this. Just promise me, no matter what you do, you won't ever go down there. Would I die? You'd be worse than dying, Jacob. Much worse. So what could be worse than dying? And why would she use these words? If going into the light simply meant physical death, then her words make no sense. However, if going into the light deprives you of your mortal body and your humanity, forever tethering you to the island, unable to die or to move on, then that indeed would be a fate worse than death. In the lost universe, human beings don't fully comprehend that death is to some extent a gift, and that to live forever is a curse. Living for hundreds or even thousands of years does not appear conducive to having a great time. More crucially, it means that your soul can never really be at rest, you can never truly let go, and you will never be able to move on. But how would Mother know this? How could she possibly know that going into the cave and the aperture of the source would be a fate worse than death? Is this simply some knowledge that a protector automatically has? Or is it possibly because Mother did it herself a very long time ago? And could this be how the original lineage of protectors was created? The best way to view Mother is as someone who demonstrates both the qualities of light and darkness. She shows love and compassion to her sons, and it's clear that she does care for them as a mother would, but we also see that she's deeply manipulative, and she also shows violent aggression towards both Claudia and her people, and most likely to anyone who ever comes to the island. While Mother certainly leans more towards the darkness, that doesn't mean she's all bad. The smoke monster half of her is full of darkness, but the protector part of her brings some balance. We see that she is capable of showing genuine affection and love to the two boys. She isn't overtly evil, and while her lies and manipulations are tantamount to abuse, she does not inflict unnecessary suffering or pain upon these stolen children. I'd also like to draw your attention to how the clothes that she wears consist of both light and dark colours. There is light above, but darkness beneath and we see that she passes on the light clothing to Jacob and the dark clothing to the boy in black. Her dim worldview on humanity ends up becoming the man in black's worldview, while her faith in the light and the importance of the island takes deep root in Jacob's burgeoning belief system. Each man is informed by different aspects of their mother, because we are all products of our parents. We can inherit their flaws, but we can also inherit their strengths. Across the Sea is almost like a parable about the sins of the parents, which is a key theme that echoes throughout the entire series. It embodies this idea of how bad parenting can have far-reaching effects on children throughout their lives. Generational trauma passed down through the ages. What makes them dangerous? The same thing that makes all men dangerous. They come, they fight, they destroy, they corrupt, and it always ends the same. They come, they fight, they destroy, they corrupt. It always ends the same. Now let's take a moment to address some interesting hypotheticals surrounding Mother being a smoke monster. We know smoke monsters can take on other forms permanently if the bodies are present on the island. It doesn't matter how decomposed they are. The man in black can still appear as himself even though his body has long since turned to bone. So we have to ask ourselves, when we meet Mother, is this what she really looked like when she was mortal? Or has she taken on the appearance of someone else that she came across long ago on the island? Could she have looked more like this when she found the cave? We also know that smoke monsters do leave behind a body twice on the island. Once when they were in their original mortal form, then once again if they are killed in their next form. We see that this happens to the man in black, his original body is found downstream by his brother Jacob, then laid to rest within the caves. Yet centuries later, we also see that Fake Lock leaves behind a body too, after he is depowered and killed. 
Had the Man in Black been appearing in his original form throughout the last season of Lost, then we would have seen him leave behind his body for a second time on the island. The point of this is, we can't be totally sure that the way Mother presents herself to people in Across the Sea is indeed what she originally looked like. Whatever the case may be, it's an interesting thought to play with. The main thing to take away from this part of the discussion is that the smoke monsters, when killed in any corporeal form, will leave behind a body. We can only imagine how long it took Mother to come to terms with what she had become, cursed to live forever without her humanity or her mortality. And we can only assume how this impacted her tribe and how they viewed her. This might even be where her withering view of humanity actually comes from. As her connection to her people was cut off, her connection to the source was awakened. She would have developed the same deep communion with the island that we see Jacob have, and over time, she would have gained relevant knowledge. Most importantly of all, she would have developed an inherent understanding that if the light goes out here, it will go out everywhere else. The earth, time, and existence itself must be protected from the ills of mankind. And this is why Mother did not want people to come to the island. Once again, it's important to deinterlace a protector from the island itself. They are not one in the same. A protector is in service of the island, yes, but they are not an embodiment of the island itself. We see that Mother was not the force bringing Claudia's people to its shores. It was not her will, it was the island's will. In fact, we see that she doesn't want people on the island full stop based on her prior experiences. Yet the island still needs people to come there, because it needs to weave its path towards the future to make sure that everything happens the way that it is supposed to. This is a tapestry that Mother will never live to see being weaved. She is simply the very first tapestry thread of many thousands more to come. What we can deduce from all this is that Mother, in her smoke monster form, genuinely was an ancient security system for the island. Her mission was to protect the source from those that were seeking to plunder its light, and she could do this physically by using her powers to crush anyone she deemed unworthy. During her tenure, she would have witnessed much conflict and violence as different tribes waged war over who got to occupy this island territory. History repeated itself so much that Mother became tired of dealing with people, and grew weary of protecting the light. Her only hope of escaping her role was to find a replacement, and then she would be able to die. And that's the catch of being an island protector. You can't leave the role or die without someone ready and willing to replace you. The battery needs to be switched out for another. And Mother's problem was that she didn't trust people enough to simply hand over the reins to any old stranger. She saw mankind as inherently corrupt, and needed someone pure to take over. Someone special. Someone she could influence and groom in her own image. So, when a pregnant Claudia arrived, the island had finally offered Mother her way out. She found her candidate in a baby that she could raise as her own a child she could keep pure and impose her own philosophies onto from a young age. She could teach this child the ways of the island, and keep them, quote, good, end quote. However, rather than one child, she got two. Buy one, get one free. She was not prepared for this, but she embraced the circumstances and murdered their mother to claim full ownership. Following this, she raised Jacob like a son, but raised the boy in black as a replacement. And this is why she tells Jacob, I love you in, in different ways. It's implied that she favours the boy in black because he demonstrated special abilities from an early age, and a natural communion with the island. He also shows signs of cunning and manipulation, which is something that the corrupted part of Mother understands all too well. The boy in black's specialness made Mother believe that the island wanted him in the role, Maybe it was even her ultimate hope that she could pass on the power of protectorship without the smoke monster curse. Either way, she believed that the boy in black was predestined to protect the light. Only she got it wrong. Very wrong. Here's the thing. The island needed both a protector and a smoke monster for many more centuries to come. In fact, it was vital that both roles exist for at least the next 2000 years, 
due to the nature of the time travel that had already been weaved into the fabric of the tapestry. And so the source split Mother's role in half between the two boys. Jacob became the protector, and the man in black became the smoke monster. This is a very literal metaphor for children taking on the different aspects of their parents. It's why Jacob and the man in black were made to be twins, a symbolic representation of two halves of the same person. The protector half, and the smoke monster half. You might reasonably ask, well how can mother possibly pass on her power to someone else when we know that the man in black cannot do the same thing? To answer this, we have to note the distinct factors that make the mother smoke monster different from the man in black smoke monster. The most obvious difference is that mother was both monster and protector. This gives her powers that the man in black does not have, because a protector has a controlling influence over the electromagnetic properties of the island. She was always able to pass on her protector power to the right party, whereas the man in black was never ordained in this way. This still leads us to a very valid question. If she is the smoke monster, then how can she be killed with a simple dagger without the need to turn off the island and depower her? Well, this channel argues that the smoke monster protector was never supposed to be invincible or unkillable. Powerful, yes. Indestructible, no. She's never gonna die, Jacob. Everything dies. So what was the one key difference between Mother's time and the Man in Black's time? Something that didn't exist back when Mother was operating on the island. That's right, there was no cork installed at the source when Mother was killed during her reign. The aperture of light in the cave was fully open, and the light flowed out freely without obstruction. But by damming the flow of light from the power source, it also rendered the man in black indestructible. Hence why, once the cork is removed, the man in black can finally be killed like a mortal man. Mother was a complete battery all on her own, with both the positive and negative charge within her. She could pass on the positive charge to Jacob without imbuing him with the negative. This enabled her to die, because the island now had its replacement battery firmly in place. The circuit can remain live, and simply trades out an older component for a newer one. With Jacob activated and in position, Mother was relieved of her responsibilities and the island allowed her to be killed. Therefore, she could die in the exact same way we see Jacob killed later on. Whilst we're on the subject of transferring power, here's some more food for thought. Do not be confounded by the ceremony we see Mother perform. The incantations she speaks and the symbolic drinking of the wine are not essential components of passing the torch to a new generation, and we know this because both Jacob and Jack perform their ceremonies somewhat differently to her. The reason why the writers made Mother give Jacob wine in this scene, and not a cup of water from the stream, is because they wanted audience to see and understand that what the candidate drinks has no bearing on the transfer of power. It can be a cup of wine, or it can be stream water from an old oceanic bottle. And what the protector says, whether it be an ancient incantation, or simply a heartfelt speech, is all just part of the ceremony too. The only two things that matter for this transfer of protectorship to take place is that the candidate makes a symbolic acceptance of the role, in this case drinking something, and that the protector touches them to make it official. It was Mother's touch during the ceremony that activated Jacob, just as he would go on to activate the light in others. It's a transfer of power through body and mind, through consciousness. And thus, Mother passed on her guardianship and legacy. We see that she was relieved, even grateful, to finally be killed and relieved of her duties. But her influence on these two boys would go on to last lifetimes. We see that Jacob's grief leads him to avenge his mother's murder, by throwing his brother into the river stream, and that stream carries the man in black's unconscious body into the mouth of the cave, down the waterfall and directly into the aperture of the source itself, thus creating yet another smoke monster. So the island now has its new battery, 
bringing both a positive and negative charge to the grid, and these two men remain interconnected, both sharing bleed over in terms of powers. We see that the source speaks to Jacob and the man in black. It guides each man on their respective path to causality. This understanding and intuition that both men demonstrate is like an inner voice speaking to them, igniting thoughts and driving choices. Whether the man in black likes it or not, he is connected to the same power source as Jacob, and since Jacob can harness the properties of the light and bend them to his will, effectively controlling the voltage, the man in black essentially becomes a prisoner, bound by his brother's rules and unable to escape. For the man in black to gain control over the voltage, he needs to break the battery and take out the positive charge. So this brings a new problem to the island's functionality, because the new smoke monster wants nothing more than to leave. The man in black. Just like Mother, the Man in Black is really nothing more than disembodied consciousness without a living vessel to carry his essence. This relegates him to stealing the guises of dead people or dead animals, because the light that was once in a dead body has already returned to the source, and therefore the Man in Black's exiled consciousness can replicate those vessels, because they are effectively empty and devoid of occupants. He is made up from all of the negative emotions and memories, the worst parts of who he was as a man, and as he scans more and more people in his smoke monster form throughout the centuries, he gradually absorbs their worst emotions and memories too, the sins from their past. Through the acquiring of so many other people's memories, the smoke monster cloud becomes more than simply the man in black's consciousness, he becomes the sum total of all the negative memories and emotions that he has absorbed into himself over time. By 2004, he had been scanning human beings for centuries, and he learned how to exploit people's psychology and emotions as a result of this accumulation of knowledge on human behaviours from over the years, making him highly skilled and highly intelligent. But the smoke monster has also become an embodiment of the past itself. All of the horrors and tragedies of the island's history, all of the corruptions of the people that came to its shores and died there, all of their worst behaviours and impulses. The man in black has essentially been poisoning his own soul, and he can no longer see the good in people anymore, only the bad, the darkness of man, and the more he absorbs from them, the more malevolent and powerful he becomes. Let's look more closely at the powers of the smoke monster in order to understand how he functions. Scanning Memories in his smoke form, the man in black can read the inner light in other people. In other words, he can scan their consciousness and absorb their memories and experiences into himself, just as the source absorbs people's consciousness in death. Through this scanning process, the smoke monster learns about both his subject and their knowledge of the outside world, helping him to understand and become more aware of life beyond the island bubble and this only fuels his desire to escape even further. We see that the scanning itself isn't very subtle. There are a series of bright blinding flashes that shutter out of the black cloud, like a paparazzi camera taking snaps. And this is what John Locke saw when the monster first came across him in Season 1 episode, Walkabout. The light was blinding, and this is why Locke tells Mr Echo that he saw a beautiful bright light. Mr. Echo, however, saw past the flashes and into the darkness of the cloud itself. Yeah, I saw it once, you know. And what did you see? I saw a very bright light. It was beautiful. That is not what I saw. Perhaps the flashes of light are physical representations of what happens in the mind of a psychic when they read or scan a person, such as when Walt intuits a feeling, in his mind it comes as a flash, or when Desmond sees a glimpse of the potential future, it comes as a flash, and when Miles hears the memories of the dead, it comes as a flash. Becoming the Dead 
The smoke monster is always roaming the landscape of the island, searching for new bodies in which he can inhabit. As previously established, the smoke monster can only take the form of someone who has died, or something that has died, because the life within them has since gone. This means that their body is now an empty vessel, and this idea is reinforced by Miles and his interpretation of death. What's taking her with us? What's the point? That's, that's not Naomi, it's just meat. Once the person is dead, the soul is gone, and the body is nothing more than meat. I explain in quite a bit of detail in my video on the island ghosts, that the smoke monster can only sustain a human form for indefinite periods of time if the body of that person is present on the island somewhere. We see this with Christian Shepherd, Mr Echo's brother Yemi, Alex Russo, and Man of Faith, John Locke. The smoke monster scans the body in the same way that Miles reads the memories of a dead person based on their remains being present. The Man in Black can also superficially appear as people who were never even on the island at all, and certainly don't have bodies there, but these are based purely on a memory capture downloaded directly from someone's brain. Examples of these apparitions include Richard Alpert's lost love Isabella, and Mr Echo's Warlords. I explore all of these apparitions and how they work in my video on the ghosts on the island, which I recommend you check out for further clarity on this specific subject. Now let's pause to discuss the actual copying process, as some people get confused over whether or not the smoke monster literally takes over a dead body, or is simply replicating it. It is confirmed in Season 5's reveal of Real John Locke's Body, that the monster photocopies the physical appearance. It does not physically reanimate them. He tends to steal the bodies and hide them somewhere, presumably underground. And this is in order to convince his marks that he really is that dead person brought back to life. We see this happen with Christian's body, Yemi's body, and to some extent John Locke's body, which he leaves in the belly of the Ajira plane. When turning into any of these forms, there is a physical transformation from ethereal smoke into a corporeal form, and it is in this reconstituted guise that the man in black has the ability to sense, touch, taste, and feel the world around him as if he were alive again. Teleportation We see the man in black doing this on numerous occasions, moving through space at the flash of a light. A good example of this is in the temple. He waits up top as John Locke, but then teleports himself underground to the chamber in order to manifest before Ben. He then goes back underground to try and separate the appearance of the smoke cloud from the apparition that will appear before Ben. This teleportation is demonstrated once again at the statue, as Bram and his crew open fire upon Fake Lock inside. We see Fake Lock hide behind a pillar, then vanish. Seconds later, the smoke monster is creeping in from the opposite side of the chamber. This teleportation power helps to explain how he appeared on the freighter in the form of Fake Christian to Michael. This is his shortcut for moving between points on the island. Telekinesis Another power of the smoke monster is his ability to move materials with his mind. Considering that the smoke monster is literally mind over matter, this one makes the most sense of all. Telekinesis, or psychokinesis, is defined as influencing a material system without physical interaction. The smoke monster can manipulate elementary particles around him, in the same way a magnet can move metal objects within a certain proximity of its charge. This is a similar, though more advanced, power that someone like Walt demonstrates, when drawing in and releasing electromagnetic energy around him. It's also a microcosm of what the light beneath the island can do to metals and alloys. And this is how Smokey turns Jacob's cabin into a funhouse in Season 3 episode The Man Behind the Curtain. He throws around furniture and breaks items. He rattles the walls. He starts a fire then puts it out, which we see him do again down in the temple worshipping chamber. He pushes Ben against the wall, then manifests briefly before disappearing again. Now, it's possible that the circle of ash around the cabin was unbroken during this scene, hence why the man in black could not properly manifest inside the cabin. And this might be the reason why he needed to pick up Claire in Season 4, 
he needed to manipulate someone to break that ash circle for him, so he could occupy the cabin properly in time for Locke's return. It's important to note that with all of these powers, the smoke monster is not omnipotent. He has weaknesses and limitations, so let's talk about them. The biggest factor that impedes the Man in Black in his goals is the source itself, because he is tethered to it like a junkyard dog leashed by a chain to a large tree. This restricts him to the energy bubble that surrounds the island and its body of water, and as long as the Protector keeps the light on, the Man in Black can never leave. What are we to make of the ancient dagger that Dogen gives to Saeed in Season 6 Episode Sundown? Dogen claims that it can kill the smoke monster, but is this true? We have seen this dagger before, and it's the same blade that stabbed Mother in the back in Across the Sea, and the very same blade that the Man in Black later gives to Richard Alpert when he manipulates him into trying to kill Jacob. So this dagger comes with history. The Man in Black might assume that because he killed the former Island Protector with it, it should be able to kill the current Island Protector too. But we see in the Season 5 finale, The Incident, that a Protector is not indestructible. They can be killed by any old weapon, no magical properties needed. Anyway, this dagger is eventually passed on to Dogen by Jacob over a century later, no doubt along with the story about how it killed a former Protector in Across the Sea. It's a mythical object, but it has no special properties or powers. So why does Dogen give it to Saeed? Well, Dogen knows that Saeed will not be able to kill the smoke monster with it. He has simply found another way to send Saeed to his death. We have seen Dogen trying to kill him a couple of times already, first with a poison pill, and then in hand-to-hand -hand combat. After his meeting with the man in black outside, Saeed even acknowledges that this was all a ruse. He knows that Dogen was simply trying to get someone else to do the deed. That's twice you've tried to have someone else kill me. There is something interesting else that Dogen says in this scene. If you allow him to speak, it is already too late. Hello, Saeed. But this statement isn't to be taken literally. As in, Dogen isn't saying that the Man in Black can only be killed before he speaks to you. He is simply implying that the Man in Black claims people simply by talking to and manipulating them. If he talks to you, he will find a way to convince you. The Man in Black says something similar of his brother, that he can be very convincing. Put this through his chest, do not hesitate, do not let him say a word. If he speaks, it will already be too late. He can be very persuasive. Ultimately, we see that the dagger does nothing, just like bullets and other mortal weapons used against him. He can only be killed by turning the source off and depowering him. In Season 6, we see that the smoke monster has become limited in what he can do after Jacob's death. He can no longer shapeshift into other dead people. He is stuck as John Locke. That's because the positive charge of the battery has died, which means the negative charge is now limited in what it can power. The battery is broken. Other general limitations include the sonar fence that creates a bubble around the Dharma barracks, of which the smoke monster cannot penetrate. These pylons produce high-intensity sound waves that create an invisible barrier. This can cause death or disorientation to a person crossing it, depending on the frequency setting, but it also appears to block the smoke monster and physically repel him. And this nicely brings us to the ash circles, that are used to keep the smoke monster out of both the cabin and the temple. The ash compound also repels the electromagnetic field of the smoke monster, creating a barrier much like the sonar fence but in a more primitive way. But where does this ash-like substance actually come from? Well, the heart of the island is essentially an ancient volcano, and volcanoes do produce ash. We don't quite know where the ashes are specifically retrieved from, but we can assume they come from the heart of the island and they are almost certainly being collected and passed out by Jacob himself. The ash compound is possibly diamagnetic in nature. We do have to acknowledge that there is a specific exchange about what exactly is keeping the smoke monster out of the temple. We see the ashes being used to fortify the entrances, but Dogen's right-hand man Lennon later proclaims, Did you realize what you just did? He was the only thing keeping it out! Idiot! You just let it in! 
As with all mythological dialogue in Lost, we do have to extrapolate the meaning of the statement. Was Dogen's life force somehow connected to the Ashes? Perhaps. It could have been a rule that Jacob introduced when he recruited Dogen years ago. However, this channel interprets this claim less literally. There's a lot of metaphors in Lost. Dogen wasn't physically keeping the smoke monster out of the temple simply by being alive. Lennon could simply mean that Dogen was the last line of defence against the smoke monster now that Jacob was gone. He's the only real mystic left on the island, with a wider knowledge base about Old Smokey, and the last best chance of keeping the candidates alive. Without Dogen, they now have to protect themselves, based on far less knowledge. It makes more logical sense that the smoke monster got inside the temple simply because Saeed, his new recruit, disturbed the ash circle on his way back inside. After all, one section of disturbed ash is all the Man in Black needed to penetrate the cabin. We will discuss the Man in Black's ability to claim or infect people later on when we explore the sickness, as there is simply too much to talk about regarding that here. The main takeaway here is that the Man in Black's various powers are what ultimately allow him to engage in a high-stakes chess match with one of the most powerful human beings on the planet. Jacob. Jacob was always the one the island needed, the true candidate who was supposed to become the new protector. Mother finally admits to this at the 11th hour when she says to him, It was always supposed to be you, Jacob. I see that now, and one day you'll see it too, but until then, you don't really have a choice. Jacob is as equally flawed like his brother, but his flaws manifest due to his naivete, he is more innocent than the man in black, and we see this in the way they interact as adults. Jacob almost comes off like a man-child, which also means he has tantrums and acts out just like a child would, and this is what leads him to punishing his brother. He wants the man in black to suffer a fate worse than death for killing their so-called mother. It's an impulsive, rash act of vengeance that he will come to regret for the rest of his life. The point is, Jacob is not perfect, nor is he supposed to be. He even describes himself as being flawed, lost, and lonely, which later becomes his criteria for choosing candidates, people he has something in common with. He likely spent many centuries in this state of arrested development, like we see in Across the Sea. His limited understanding of human behaviour was the result of growing up so sheltered and isolated. Unlike the Man in Black, he had little to no contact with other people. Jacob's own sense of culpability over what he did to his brother most likely took centuries to come to terms with. He clearly feels immense guilt over his actions and is trying to reckon with his past mistakes, just like our Losties. In fact, it's worth looking at Jacob as a patchwork of other characters. He has the naivete and faith of John Locke, the stubbornness of Jack Shepard, the manipulative tendencies of James Ford, and the guilt of Kate Austen. Any wisdom that Jacob demonstrates was surely acquired over time. The longer he lived, the more he came to find himself and understand his own powers and the nature of fate. But it wouldn't have come to him overnight, it was most definitely a process of trial and error. He initially tries to bring people to the island to build a peaceful society that will harmoniously coexist together, one that will help him to prove his brother wrong about human nature and the island's purpose in the grand scheme of existence. Because if Jacob can prove to the man in black that mankind is redeemable and that their lives are precious, then the island has a purpose in the world and a reason to be protected, and he might just be able to save his brother's soul from the darkness and bring him back to the light. Just because the Man in Black has transformed into something else, doesn't mean that Jacob feels any less for him, or feels any less responsible for making him that way in the first place. On a psychological level, Jacob was still naive to the reality of the situation. Remember, he's a man-child at this point. He couldn't face the fact that his brother was all but gone. 
Ultimately, the man in black was the only person left on the island that Jacob ever had a true bond and connection with. So, winning this game wasn't about achieving an arbitrary or pointless personal victory. Winning the game might effectively save the man in black's soul and stop him from trying to upset the balance of the island by trying to destroy every society that Jacob tried to build. Still, many fans quite reasonably ask, well, why couldn't Jacob just come out and tell everyone what to do, or what he wants from them? Jacob does make an attempt to explain this to Richard Alpert in the season 6 episode, Abiturno. Before you brought my ship, there were others? Yes, many. What happened to them? They're all dead. But if you brought them here, why didn't you help them? Because I wanted them to help themselves. To know the difference between right and wrong without me having to tell them. It's all meaningless if I have to force him to do anything. Why should I have to step in? If you don't, he will. Jacob understands that people need to work things out for themselves, and to let the island guide everyone accordingly. He steps in only when necessary, and he makes this paramount to Richard. And that becomes the point of installing Richard as the go-between so that Jacob could provide a guiding hand to people indirectly, without compromising their free choice, or, more importantly, the island's influence. This is his way of running things. Now, it's not the best way, as other characters later point out. People can't leave the island. That's how Jacob ran things. Maybe there's another way. A better way. As previously mentioned, Jacob was flawed in both his planning and his ideological outlook. But he was also a slave to the machinations of fate and had little choice himself. A protector comes to have an inherent understanding of the light and destiny. People need to have a choice, and the island needs to facilitate those choices. Jacob is an emissary, not a puppet master. He can't step in and become a benign dictator because that would undermine not just his own philosophy, but also the island's role in shaping events that need to take place, and to weave a thread towards the future. Unfortunately, as we see, Jacob's attempts to sway the man in black and create a new society on the island only ever end in death, carnage, and corruption, often with a helping hand from the man in black himself. For centuries, this game played out between the two men. Jacob would bring people to the island to build this new society, and the Man in Black would find a way to undermine and subvert that society. It was a game, but it was still a very crucial one. A game that would determine the outcome and fate of humanity itself. However, this game reached a dangerous apex when the Egyptians came to their shores. The Egyptian history on the island lies at the very centre of the lost mythology, but we only ever saw fragments of it throughout the show, and one of the biggest questions to come out of these fragments is this. Did the Egyptian period come before or after the events that were depicted in Across the Sea? Well, we don't know exactly when Across the Sea is taking place in time, but judging from the tools, the clothing, and the use of Latin, it is estimated to be around 2,000 years ago. Many people assume that this means it must be taking place after the Egyptian settlement has already come and gone from the island. However, the Egyptian era lasted for almost 30 centuries in the real world, and it overlapped with the Roman era. There was literally a specific period in Egypt's history known as Roman Egypt, in which the Romans created a province there. Roman province Egypt still worshipped Egyptian gods, and built statues to glorify these gods. Following the Roman invasion of Egypt in 30 BC, the use of hieroglyphics did begin to slowly die out, with the last known writing of them occurring in the 5th century AD. The point is, these two cultures existed alongside one another at the same time, and continued to do so for almost seven centuries. So it makes sense that Egyptians came to the island in order to escape Roman rule, and to keep their culture alive. 
The island was a place in which they could restore their civilization and rebuild the Egyptian Empire in a new land. So the matter of which civilization came first in real world chronological history actually has no bearing on the island's own history. Across the Sea is taking place during the Roman Egyptian period. Claudia's people came first, and we know this in part because of what is omitted in Across the Sea. If the writers really wanted us to know that this episode was taking place after the Egyptians had already come and gone, then they would have shown us something related to that period. The temple. The statue. The lighthouse. The tunnels. The hieroglyphs. Something. Anything. But they don't. The island is intentionally depicted as being sparsely populated, with no structures or civilizations in sight, and the caves are where Mother resides because no other structures have been built yet. Even the Man in Black's village has been constructed from scratch in an open clearing. Claudia's people are not inhabiting pre-made structures here. By this point they had been on the island for over a decade, and they had had plenty of opportunity to explore and adapt to their environment. Don't you think if the temple already existed, they would have settled within its walls? Across the Sea also never suggests that there were other people on the island other than Claudia's group from the shipwreck. When Mother meets Claudia in the beginning of the episode, the implication is that Mother has been alone there for some time. After all, if there were Egyptians still living somewhere on the island, or any other civilization full stop, that means there would be lots of children around. So, surely Mother would have simply taken a baby from one of those communities by now. Again, we only need to apply logic to the possibilities to extract a likely answer. Mother wouldn't be so enthralled by Claudia's arrival and her pregnancy if there were babies being born elsewhere on the island. In all of her power, she could have just entered a camp and taken a newborn. As a smoke monster, they would have had no chance of stopping her. So, Claudia is clearly the first person Mother has come across on the island in some time. The Senet game, washing ashore a decade later as discovered by the boy in black, was a way to further highlight this idea of concurrent cultures, that we are currently in a period where both Romans and Egyptians were navigating the Mediterranean Sea at the same time, and that Egyptians were very close by. It's incredibly likely that the island is somewhere in the Mediterranean Sea at this point in time, perhaps not too far away from the coast of Tunisia. Now, Mother takes credit for giving the boy in black the game, but we also know that she is grooming him to become her replacement. From the way that the game is positioned in the sand, it's clearly washed ashore. I mean, why plant it there for him to find if she could have simply given it to him? Mother is trying to cover her tracks and reinforce the lie that there is nothing else beyond the island. There is nowhere else. The island is all there is. Further points of evidence that Across the Sea predates the Egyptian period on the island are more obvious. The stone cork and the completed donkey wheel chamber both feature hieroglyphic symbols, which suggest these were constructed and installed by Egyptian settlers. Yet we see the man in black building an early version of the wheel. He is prevented from completing the work by Mother, and she buries the chamber. So why is Ben standing in a very similar looking chamber 2,000 years later? Is it possible the man in black influenced the Egyptians to complete his work? If you look close enough, there are hieroglyphs in the finished donkey wheel chamber which tell us that Egyptians used the Roman design and finished construction on the wheel, leaving behind their signature. Furthermore, we also know that the Man in Black is transformed into the smoke monster by being sucked into the open aperture of the source. If the stone cork was already in place down there, then he would not have transformed at all. He simply would have died slowly from the radiation exposure, like the bodies that Desmond comes across. I've seen several theories articulated over the years in regards to all this, and those theories often revolve around the idea that Jack became the new smoke monster after he died, but this is simply not the case. Jack did not transform into a new smoke monster because the cork was back in place when the light was reactivated. Remember, only someone entering the open aperture of the source and going into the source of light directly can be turned into a smoke monster. The stone cork 
blocks the light and uses a water circulation system to stop it from overheating. But this system also means that creating a smoke monster could never happen again, because in order to get to the heart of the island, you need to uncork the source. And by doing that, you effectively turn the light off. Therefore, Jack was never exposed to the light in its fullest aperture like the Man in Black was two millennia ago. No one can be turned into a smoke monster when the cork is in and the light is refracted through the water. As we see, Jack was simply transported out of the cave by the light. Had he been transformed like the Man in Black, he wouldn't have been alive following such an event. His body would simply be an empty vessel and his consciousness roaming freely. That's why when Jacob finds his brother's body, he is dead, whereas when we see Jack in that very same spot, he is still alive, his consciousness intact. Which means the man in black was the last of his kind, and that is why the events of season 6 and the series in general proved to be the most crucial in the island's entire history. Let's circle back to the cave. Here's a shot of the cave in Across the Sea before the cork is installed. Look at how beautifully bright the light is. It is so powerful that it is breaching the rock formations around the cave entrance. Now here is a shot of the cave entrance 2000 years later, with the cork now blocking the light. Its brightness has vastly diminished because the light flow has been damned. Let's look a little more closely at the cork itself. There are four lines of ancient script that can be glimpsed on the top of the stone. The upper two lines are Egyptian hieroglyphs, while the bottom two are cuneiform script. The translations are as follows. Line 1. Embrace that which the balance hath weighed. Let a path be made for Osiris in the great valley, and let Osiris have light to guide him on his way. Now Osiris was the ancient Egyptian god of the dead and the underworld. He was the god of the resurrection into eternal life, and stood in judgement of the deceased. Does that sound like anyone you know? The smoke monster's appearances to the Egyptians as dead people would not have been understood in the way that we understand them. We know these apparitions are imposters, the smoke monster role-playing as those who have died. But to the Egyptians, these manifestations were literally proof that the smoke monster was bringing back the spirits of dead people from the other side to commune with the Egyptian settlers, and this is why the Egyptians worshipped the man in black in his smoke form. To them, the smoke cloud was the physical manifestation of Osiris, which also explains why he is depicted alongside Anubis on the chamber wall beneath the temple. Anubis was a close ally of Osiris. He was the Egyptian god of mummification and the afterlife, as well as the patron god of lost souls. The reference to the Great Valley is clearly a reference to an afterlife much akin to the Flash Sideways, which further draws a connection between the power of the light and the afterlife, helping to bond the concept of the Sideways together with the heart of the island, and how these two planes of reality are interlinked. It's very likely that the Egyptians considered this hole in the cave to be the literal gateway to the afterlife, to their very own Great Valley. Line 2 on the cork. He hath reconciled the two fighters, Horus and Set, the guardians of life. This line suggests that the Egyptians had projected their own mythology onto the conflict between the two brothers just as future island inhabitants would project their own belief systems onto the two characters. Modern day audiences like us initially viewed the two brothers as representations of God and the Devil, even though Jacob and the Man in Black are neither. Other biblical comparisons included Cain and Abel, and Jacob and Esau. What I'm getting at here is that every civilization in their own time have similar myths of gods and monsters, and depending on your culture and history, you might project your own beliefs onto the things around you. Back then, to the Egyptians, the power struggle between Jacob and the Man in Black resembled that of the ancient Osiris myth, which is considered one of the most important Egyptian myths. Here's a brief summary. Set was a god who usurped and killed his own brother Osiris. This led to another conflict with his other brother Horus. Both Set and Horus battled for control of the throne and kingship, and this comparison implies that the Man in Black and Jacob are the two fighters mentioned on the cork inscription, 
and that the Egyptians had become split between these two guardians, one of whom was a guardian of life, and the other who was a guardian of death. Line 3 translates as, Break the immovable yoke that we may sleep. And the final line reads, That silence may reign and we may sleep. Now, the yoke was a type of harness created for chariot horses. In other words, it was an unbreakable link between two things, and by implication of the words, to break this link would mean that the Egyptians could finally sleep. To sleep is another way of saying death, and the silence most likely means an end to the conflict between Jacob and the man in black, and that the dead can finally be at rest. It is only at the end of the series that we see the silence, aka an era of peace, come to the island, because the immovable yoke has finally been broken. Simply put, the brothers and their link to one another, and more importantly their link to the heart of the island, has been untethered, and the Egyptian prayer finally delivered. Eagle-eyed fans have noted that these bottom two lines on the stone cork are inscribed in cuneiform script, which was also used throughout the Egyptian period and right up to the Common Era, which could also imply that other people, after the Egyptians, might have entered the cave to add their own prayers to the cork. Another example that demonstrates the chronology of events as explained in this video so far, is Jacob's tapestry in the statue. Look at it very closely, because it depicts the story of the Egyptian civilization that existed on the island. A pair of wings are outstretched from an encircled eye of Horus. Remember, Horus is the god that the Egyptians believed Jacob to represent, and the eye is a symbol of protection, royal power, and good health. Notice how the image also depicts 17 long arms emanating like rays out from the eye, pointing towards and touching Horus's followers, as if choosing or selecting them to come with him to the island, to paradise. Now who do we know who goes around doing such a thing? Horus is clearly Jacob in this scenario. The other symbols and imagery on the tapestry appear to depict Jacob's utopian vision of what a harmonious island looked like before the man in black corrupted it. The Egyptians use jugs to fill the water from the stream and play music and dance and celebrate life. They harvest crops and build a home. They live in peace until the day comes in which they have to leave behind the island. The tapestry ends with the representation of the departure, moving away from the island, either to escape it or simply from being sent away. Notice the missing piece in the corner there. It was ripped off by Jacob and used as an effective visual message to Alana at the cabin on where she should go next. The original tapestry would have looked something like this. There is a lesser seen item in the statue that is hard to get a full view of in the actual series, but can be seen enhanced on the Lost Season 5 DVD box set. It's a woven rug, no doubt made in the same way by Jacob using the loom. We see the man in black rip off a corner of this rug and use it to clean the bloody knife that Ben had used to stab Jacob in the Season 6 opener, LAX. Now, this rug depicts images and references to war, enslavement, and murder, heavily alluding to the idea that there was a division that grew between the Egyptian settlers, a division that led to tribal warfare. Phrases have been weaved into the rug in Greek, Now you must embrace this evil war. The ground ran with blood. Then death's black cloud enveloped. I think these images and phrases speak for themselves, especially the one about death's black cloud. I think we know precisely what is meant by this. So, we see that Jacob has a very clear knowledge and affinity for this Egyptian culture, as demonstrated by the tapestry and the rug. Even more so, he uses an Ankh as his personal crest. We know that the others associate Jacob with this symbol because Dogen automatically knows the message within Hurley's guitar case is legitimate since it arrived in the Ankh. It's essentially Jacob's signature. Also, let us not forget Jacob's choice to reside inside the actual statue itself. For those that believe the Egyptians were on the island first, ask yourself, why would Jacob have any affinity for a culture that died out long before he was ever there, long before he was ever born? 
there would be no reason for him to cling to these symbols, stories, and this history if he never had any interaction with it. In the audio commentary for Across the Sea, showrunners Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse actually go out of their way to confirm this historical chronology, if you listen carefully enough. Damon Lindelof says, If I were to have a theory that the apparatus we see in the finale, with the stone sticking in the middle of the pool, that's sort of blocking the light, maybe that apparatus wasn't created until after this event. Carlton responds, I think that's an incredibly likely deduction, Damon. Now we've established that the Egyptians created and placed the cork in the cave, but they also built the water runoff system which appears to channel this light infused water from the source directly into several man-made tunnels. And these tunnels no doubt connect to several key areas on the island. One of them is most definitely the Temple Spring, several miles away in the Dark Territory. A temple which is also adorned in hieroglyphs both above ground and below ground. Now let's connect all of these dots and clues to deduce the probable events that unfolded during the Egyptian period on the island. They came to the island seeking a new world away from their dying civilization under Roman rule. Perhaps Jacob hoped that they would demonstrate the good of mankind by living harmoniously together. It was his first real chance to prove his brother wrong about humanity, and maybe by having people on the island, it might give the man in black more of a reason to stay. Who needs to see what lies across the sea, if what lies across the sea can come to them? However, the problem was Jacob didn't want to get involved. Maybe he didn't quite know how to, especially considering he had no social skills to speak of, nor any real understanding of human nature and this left the Egyptians open to external manipulations. We know this civilization lived on the island for a very long time, as evidenced by the infrastructure that they built there. Some of the construction of these colossal island landmarks would have taken decades to complete. The statue of Taura itself is a testament to that. I have already discussed why the Egyptians built this statue in my video on the pregnancy crisis, which you can check out for more detail on this particular subject. In a nutshell, Taurat was the ancient Egyptian patron of childbirth and the protector of women and children. I speculate that this was likely erected as a monument to the island's healing properties and its power to give life. Wounds, ailments, and illnesses could heal, whereas elsewhere they would almost certainly be fatal. More crucially, procreation thrived amongst the settlers, and new babies were conceived and born regularly. We can assume that the Egyptians had various settlements around the island, by the beach, in the valleys, and in the jungle. But one of their main settlements became based around the Dark Territory. So let's talk about how the temple came to exist. We can fairly deduce that the original purpose of this particular structure was to worship the smoke monster. Judging from the hieroglyphs in the chamber beneath the outer wall, the man in black made this place his home long before Jacob's healing spring was ever created. And the man in black ingratiated himself with the Egyptians before Jacob did, and no doubt demonstrated his ability to summon the dead. He wanted to stay close to these newcomers, and to use them as a means to an end, just like he did with the Roman villagers, because he was still looking for a way off the island. At this point in time, it's almost certain that he wasn't killing indiscriminately like we see him doing in the 20th and 21st centuries. He is not yet at the end of his tether, and he thinks that these people could still be of use to him especially seeing as Jacob was refusing to engage or interfere in their evolution. So the Egyptians worshipped the man in black in his smoke monster form, mistaking him for the ancient Egyptian god Osiris because of his abilities. While his human identity as the man in black would have been viewed as a separate entity altogether, therefore he could play both the role of smoke monster and smoke monster summoner and so he would summon the black smoke to help guide, instruct, and judge the Egyptians, becoming both a source of knowledge and fear. If we look at the actual worshipping chamber, it appears to have been built long before the temple itself, and seems to be the first structure built in this area. 
It's about the same depth as the other underground tunnels that we see the others using in Season 5. That's because this extensive network of tunnels were constructed around this worshipping chamber that ran beneath the island itself, and many of these tunnels would have started off life as wells up above. The Man in Black had instructed the Egyptians to start digging. He was looking for the light once again. And these tunnels began to form an underworld for the smoke monster to inhabit as they search the island for more pockets of energy. We know that the smoke monster still uses these underground tunnels to get around right up until contemporary times. There are vents all over the island. During this period of digging and construction, the Egyptians would have come across a rope in the ground. A rope that had been left by a time traveller by the name of James Ford. And this rope went all the way down into the earth, leading them directly to a primary pocket of energy. Once a new well had been constructed at this site, the Man in Black directed his people to finish his work by building the wheel chamber. Let's pause for a second. It's often been asked if the donkey wheel chamber we see the Man in Black constructing in Across the Sea is the same chamber that resides beneath the Orchid site in the future. Well, we know that there were many wells that Claudia's people appear to have dug during their time on the island. The Man in Black explains the following to Jacob. There are very smart men among us, men who are curious about how things work. And together we have discovered places all over this island where metal behaves strangely. When we find one of these sites, we dig. And this time we found some. We even see the remnants of an abandoned well that failed to reach an electromagnetic pocket. This is the same well that Desmond is pushed into centuries later by Fake Lock. If we really look at the well in Across the Sea and compare it to the Orchid site, they are clearly different locations. One is in an open wooded area, while the other is deep in the jungle. They are not the same place. Mother buried the first site under earth, and effectively destroyed all of the work down there. The second site was created many years later, long after the Statue of Tarot had already been built, but some time before the Egyptians splintered into warring factions. Sawyer's rope led them to build a new well in which they could descend into the earth and forge a tunnel towards the light pocket, and this is how we know beyond any doubt that the Man in Black had the Egyptians in the palm of his hand at this point because the wheel system they construct is identical to that of his design in Across the Sea. It was surely the Man in Black's hope that he might still be able to escape the island in this way. If he could just finish his work on the wheel and be able to turn it, he could be transported off the island, and thus he would be free. But after construction was complete and the wheel was turned, the realisation would have finally hit him. He was trapped. We see him occupying the chamber with Locke in the Season 5 episode, This Place is Death. The light consumes Locke and transports him off island, yet has no effect on fake Christian. The Man in Black could not escape this way, only others who pushed the wheel would be moved off island. But of course, something else moved too, the island itself. And the consequences of this very first turning of the wheel were greater than anyone could have anticipated. Mother seemed to recognise the risks when she first confronted her surrogate son in the original chamber. Turning that wheel would irreversibly harm the island, and thus, the ancient incident was triggered. So let's talk about it. We learn that the wheel system was designed to channel natural water flow from the island into the pocket of light, and this in turn caused a reaction. A large burst of energy engulfs the island and it jumps from one geographical location to another. Until this point, the island only ever moved naturally, in its own time. But this was a man-made violation of a natural process. I've previously discussed the island as being much like a living organism. The source in the cave at the heart of the island is its literal heart, hence its name while the other light pockets around the island are its organs and arteries. And the water that flows around the island is much like blood flowing through veins. When the Egyptians rebuilt the wheel and turned it, this rerouted the bloodstream from the heart and caused the equivalent of an island heart attack. This heart attack destabilised the core of the source itself, causing it to spasm and overheat. 
because it takes a very large amount of energy to move the island as we see, and this drains the source of its power and ability to self-regulate. Finally, this is when Jacob realised that he would have to intervene, because he's the only person on the island who can find the heart of the island. The ancient incident would have forced him into action, and he would have led a group of the Egyptians to the cave in order to assist him. These volunteers essentially carry out a form of heart surgery, and to avoid suffering a similar fate to Jacob's brother, they would have belayed themselves down the throat of the cave, much like Desmond did and avoided being swept up in the stream of water, or entering the aperture of the source directly. Jacob instructed them to contain the energy before it burnt itself out. Think of the cork like a pacemaker that keeps the heart beating, while the continuous water stream helps to keep the source from overheating. The only way to keep the light on was to dam its flow and create a coolant system with the water. Although we do see that corking the source was not without its own set of grave consequences, people could still be irradiated by the close proximity to the light. The only reason why Desmond didn't die from the exposure was because of his unique resistance to electromagnetism, built up over years of pushing the button, and absorbed into him when he turned the failsafe key. In exchange for helping Jacob to plug this leak, and the sacrifices it required, the Egyptians were granted permission to build the water runoff system that would channel the island's healing properties directly into their sacred grounds at the temple, thereby creating a spring and a reward of extended life. This system would have taken some time to construct, and the levels of radiation from this incident would have eventually cost the lives of many of the workers down there. Part of this bargain with Jacob appears to have been turning their backs on the smoke monster and the man in black. They walled off the smoke monster's worshipping chamber beneath the temple grounds, and built over it, hence why there was no clear way to access the chamber for Ben in Season 5 episode, Dead is Dead. He only finds it because the floor gives out beneath his feet, no doubt with some help from Fake Lock's telekinetic powers. It's not an active chamber, and it hasn't been used for centuries. If you look closely in the background you can actually see where the original entrance was sealed off, this is also why the others were seemingly unaware of the existence of this chamber beneath their feet, because it had long since been buried. Ben was the leader of the others for a long time and had no idea that this place was here. Watch him as he inspects the ruins down there with great fascination. It's clearly his first time in the smoke monster's den. The healing spring became the new focal point of these sacred grounds, and this might have been what caused the split between the Egyptian settlers those that still aligned with the man in black, and those that now sided with Jacob, who had offered them a taste of the island's power without risking further destruction. It's likely that the outer wall around the temple grounds was built to create a strategic stronghold around the temple, and this would have happened after the settlers split into their opposing factions, claiming territory on behalf of their respective deities, Jacob as the giver of life, and the man in black as the gatekeeper of death. What was once the smoke monster's temple, was now Jacob's. This brings us to the summoning chamber outpost in the Valley of the Dharma Barracks that we see Ben using in Season 4 and Season 5. The existence of this place might very well have been the result of the Egyptians splitting between their two gods, Horus and Set. Since the original worshipping chamber was now cut off, the Man in Black's acolytes had to create a new home, in which they could commune with their underground deity. This valley was the spot they chose, like many future settlers. Let's investigate the Summoning Chamber outpost more closely, because people often wonder how it works in regards to the functionality. This is my speculation on how the physics operate. Firstly, notice how the plug and drain system is very similar to the stone cork in the heart of the island only instead of clear running water infused with light, it's dirty, murky water. When Ben reaches in, he pulls out something akin to a cork, and the water drains out into the ground. This is a micro version of the stone cork process, only instead of turning off the light, it brings out the smoke monster. We can assume that the water draining down the sinkhole activates an ancient counterweight system, the counterweight connects to the smoke monster's chamber beneath the temple. 
We know that the man in black still uses it as a den of some sort, since Fakelot claims to Ben that this is where the smoke monster lives. Now, I know this isn't the classiest example to use, but think of how the flush lever works on a toilet cistern. It activates water to flush out a pipeline to a lower level, and this counterweight shift and draining of water alerts Smokey to the call. Maybe water fills up his chamber and forces him out from his den, or maybe the water is simply channelled into something else that stirs his attention. Either way, it gets him to leave the temple grounds to see what's up. Meanwhile, the counterweight eventually moves back into position, pushing the muddy water and the plug lock back up through the hole to seal it again. Simple physics. And so it goes. The two Egyptian factions were born. The temple grounds became home to Jacob's followers, while the man in black zealots were cast out into the middle of the island to plot their next move. In Lost, history is always repeating itself, and I think the reason why the writers never give us a flashback to all of this and simply leave us breadcrumbs to follow is because what took place thousands of years ago is very similar to what we see take place in the series, especially the final season. Groups are split between loyalty to the man in black and those aligned with Jacob. It's the same story really, right down to an incident being caused that leads to a war and purge-like event while people switch sides during the chaos and the violence, fighting between the pull of the light and the draw of the dark. I would be remiss to not mention the other iconography that we see adorning the temple's structure and its interiors. Both the temple spring and the smoke monster chamber are clearly Egyptian in design and build, as evidenced by the hieroglyphics and the architecture but there are many other aspects of the structure built above and around these ancient chambers that appear to have different cultural influences from different centuries. The architecture of the main temple building itself actually resembles that of the ancient Mayan temples. Based on glimpses of external iconography, the temple was clearly occupied by many different cultures and civilizations over the years, as there are both Buddhist and Hindu influences present. These cultures appear to have built upon the Egyptians' initial structures, adding to the architecture over time, but the healing pool is what everything appears to have been built around, with the smoke monster's chamber long since forgotten. This means that the others were just many in a long line of groups to occupy this territory and treat it as a sacred place. Jacob brought these groups to the island across the centuries, and many of them made these grounds their home because of the spring and the outer walls fortification. It is unknown how the Egyptian civilization ended on the island, although Jacob's tapestry does suggest that many of the Egyptians left the island in boats of their own accord, possibly to escape escalating conflict with the man in black and the tribal infighting. I like to believe that Jacob actually bonded with some of the Egyptians that followed him, and this is what reinforced his belief about the good within people, and also enriched his life to the point where he adopted their cultural attitudes and symbology. So maybe he was simply sending away his friends so they would not suffer any more losses at the hands of war and his brother's growing malevolence. They wouldn't be the last people to come to the island, then return back to the world after their purposes had been served. We know that those who remained on the island were eventually wiped out, either by the man in black or general human conflict. Jacob confirms as much to Richard in Abiterno. All that remains of these people by the time Oceanic 815 crashes on the island are ancient ruins and old relics from a time that has long since passed into memory and myth. Yet the series of conflicts and events from this ancient period on the island directly inform everything that happens in the future. In the next part we shall explore how Jacob and the Man in Black's game transformed the landscape of the island into a literal and spiritual battleground, and how it sucked in people from across the world throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. In that part we will examine how their conflict gave birth to both the others and the candidates. Thank you for watching. Please like, share and subscribe to keep this channel alive. Consider donating to the Patreon to help me make more content just like this. And until the next time, stay lost.